the boat sort of went up on its front, which meant like the back flipped up into the air and I fell out. I remember hitting the water and going underneath the water. I didn't know which way was up. I was trying to think of my safety instruction. I don't even know where my legs are in relation to the rest of my body. I just remember being very disorientated. And then what happened, and I can only see this in hindsight, is that my consciousness split in two. So there was the very human me that was in the water. I'm feeling like being hit by the rocks and bumping up against logs and branches and feeling the water and seeing bubbles everywhere. And it was, there was the sound in my ears of, you know, that feeling when you're underwater. And then there was another part of me that was outside of my body, watching my body. And I was in a room, the room, it didn't have walls. So it's hard to describe. I think when you have these experiences, it can be really hard to articulate them and put them into words. But I felt really, I, I just felt myself that I was in a room. It was pitch black. It was, um, there was no one else that I could see. All I could see was if I looked to one direction, I could see my body in the water. I'm so happy to invite Lauren Dinesius to the show. Lauren, how are you? I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you. I'm doing really well. And I'm so happy to be here too. Yeah. You wanted to come on and share your near-death experience. So we're going to talk about that. But tell me first about who you were before your near-death experience happened. Yeah. So I was a very um, left-brained, um, scientifically focused a registered nurse. I was brought up in a very strict Christian upbringing, you know, going to church every Sunday, going to all the the youth groups and youth camps and, and all of these things. So anything spiritual, I guess, was very out of my realm. Um, you know, we were taught that sort of, you know, anything spiritual really was like work of the devil and, and things like that. So I, I came from a very yeah, traditional and very conservative upbringing. And that continued right through until my teenager, teenage years. And then I, I left the church, sort of did my own thing, studied nursing. And then I went on to, um, to work with um, critically unwell babies. That had always been my plan. I'd always loved babies. I'd always wanted to look after them, care for them the eldest of three kids. So I was that real like mother hen, you know, my younger brother and sister. So yeah, it was very, very conservative, a very limited um, exposure to anything outside of the church. And then going into nursing, that was very science-based, very um, evidence-based, like show me the show me the research, show me the evidence, um, very black and white. You know, if this happens, you do this, um, being guided by policies, procedures, um, protocols, all of these things. So that was very much my thinking and probably in my late twenties, not that I ever labeled myself this, but I was probably more at a point of being an atheist. I didn't, I'd sort of moved away from my Christian upbringing. I didn't believe in the God, I guess, that I was taught about, I felt that he was very judgmental and very, um, not very nice to some people. And, um, yeah. And so I sort of had shifted from that just in my own ways. Um, my family is still, um, quite religious. And so I've been a bit of a black sheep really, but yeah, but that was really my experience, um, for that first, say 30 years of my life. And then it was when I was 31 that I had the the near-death experience. So then you have this near-death experience and it really kind of catapulted you into the spiritual journey and changed your entire life. What happened? Yeah, so I had, I got to a point in my nursing career where I was burnt out. I was, you know, obviously caring for critically unwell babies. It was a very emotionally um, challenging job as well as like the physical demands of shift work and, and all of these things. And so I was at a point where I'm like, I don't understand why babies are dying. I don't understand why, you know, birth trauma happens. I don't understand. I could not, I could understand why old people died, but I couldn't understand why babies died. And it was, 
you know, when you work in an intensive care unit for babies, it's unfortunately a relatively common experience. And so I was at this point where I'm like, if God exists, he's doing a really bad job because he should not be, he should be saving these babies. He should not be allowing them to die. So I guess I was at a point where I was, I was burnt out. I was drained. I was confused. I was upset. Um, and so I decided to take a break from nursing and do some traveling. So I went over to Africa Um, And I thought I'm going to get away from hospitals, doctors, parents, babies. And I was going to go and um, volunteer with animals in Africa. And so I did that and I just went and I didn't really know what the plan was. Um, I thought I would just come back to Australia when, whenever I felt like it. And I ended up being there for seven months, but it was about five months into the trip that I decided to go whitewater rafting. It's something I'd done before. I wasn't particularly an adrenaline junkie or anything like that, but I just felt, yeah, I'm like, I just wanted to to go rafting again. And so I, you know, I signed up and I remember walking with a whole bunch of other people um, down into, it was like a, a valley um, that you had to walk down into to get to the Zambezi River. Um, in Africa and it was the very last week of the season so it meant that the water was quite low because it hadn't been a lot of rain Um, and when the water's row is low when you're rafting it means the rocks and everything are sitting quite high compared to the water and so we were warned it was going to be a bumpy ride Um, and I just had this funny feeling I, I can't put my finger on it I just thought I was nervous um you know, you go through the safety instruction procedure and everything. So it, you know, it does bring up a little anxiety. Anyway, I got into the raft and and off we went and we went through the first few rapids. Okay. Um, and then I can't remember, it was maybe five or six rapids into, um, this course that, um, the boat sort of went up on its front, which meant like the back flipped up into the air and I fell out. I was the only one that fell out. Everyone else somehow managed to stay in the raft. Um, and I remember hitting the water and going underneath the water and being completely disorientated. I didn't know which way was up. I was trying to think of my safety instruction where they say, you know, I can't even remember now if you meant to like push your feet out in front of you or bring your feet in close. I couldn't remember. All I remember is that I don't know which way is up. I don't even know where legs are in relation to the rest of my body I just remember being very disorientated and then what happened and I can only see this in hindsight is that my consciousness split in two so there was the very human me that was in the water I'm feeling like being hit by the rocks and bumping up against logs and branches and um feeling the water and seeing bubbles everywhere and it was um there was the sound in my ears of you know that feeling when you're underwater um, but being completely disorientated with that, not able to breathe. And then there was another part of me that was outside of my body, watching my body. And I was in a room, um, the room, it didn't have walls. So it's hard to describe. I think when you have these experiences, it can be really hard to articulate them and put them into words. But I felt really, I, I just felt myself that I was in a room. It was pitch black. It was, um, There was no one else that I could see. All I could see was if I looked to one direction, I could see my body in the water. And if I looked straight ahead, I could see, I was seeing parts of my life. I was seeing my family. I was seeing, I had like an eight-year-old niece at the time. I was seeing, you know, my workplace, colleagues, friends, family, um, different situations in my life, you know, and coming from a background as like, I didn't know any of this. I didn't know anything about past lives or or life reviews or the afterlife or like I wasn't I was aware of heaven and hell and that was about it and so and this didn't feel like either and so it was just really confusing for me and it also it was only several years later that I realized that it was even a near-death experience because you know you hear a lot of you know of white light and tunnels and angels and it being a blissful experience and not wanting to leave and for me, it was very fearful. So I think for me, I didn't actually get too far 
across that threshold. Like I didn't, I wasn't, it's was like I was blocked. I was unable to even get to the the tunnel where the light was, let alone go through it. Um, but I remember again seeing essentially my life flashing before my eyes. And then I heard a voice. I didn't, it wasn't my voice. It wasn't a voice I recognized. It was a male voice. Like it was a deep sounding voice, but there was no person attached to that voice. And all they said was, it's not your time. You need to go back for the children. And I was like, you know, I didn't have my own children. The only child in my life was my niece who was eight. And I thought maybe I need to go back for her. Maybe something's going to happen to my sister. Like I need to care for her. Like I didn't, I didn't know. And then it wasn't long after I heard that voice that I was rescued. So I'd been through two or three rapids um, in quite quick succession, a little bit of still water in between, but not enough to sort of get my bearings. And then, yeah. And then as not long after that voice, I had this um, feeling of being like pulled up onto the back of, a kayak or, or, or a canoe or something and then being taken to to the shore. So um, I was convinced, the nurse in me was convinced that I'd had a panic attack. Um, again, I was very unaware of anything spiritual and not particularly interested in any of that. So the nurse in me and that logical left brain was like you had a panic attack. It was just a panic attack. You just like freaked out because you're in the water and you couldn't breathe. And, you know, I very much played it down and didn't think much about it. Um, and it was only, you know, I traveled through Africa for a couple more months, came back to Australia, still didn't want to have anything to do with baby. So I started working in a different area of nursing um, in the operating room and still away from babies. Um, but after a while I got called, I just felt this pull to go back to the nursery. And I thought, well, if I'm going to go back to the nursery, like things need to be different because I can't keep running away to Africa whenever I can't deal with my job. So I sort of said to the universe, like, you know, an ultimatum, like if, if I need to go back to the nursery, things need to be, to be different. And so, you know, I should mention that in probably that three years between coming back from Africa and going back to the nursery, I suddenly started being interested in yoga and meditation and things like energy healing. And I'd started to um, see things in my mind when I would meditate. And I remember um, having like a massage in the, in the USA um, a few, yeah, during this period of time. And I was seeing these images that I didn't understand. And when I asked about them with the massage therapist, she's like, it sounds like you're, you've just witnessed a past life. And I'm like, what's a past life? Like I was so clueless to any of these things, but in hindsight, I can see that that experience in the river, it's like it, it changed my trajectory and without even really being conscious of it, it, there was something in me that was awakened or maybe ignited to look at these different things and be drawn to the more spiritual side. But it wasn't until my shared death experiences that I was Googling what on earth has happened, what am I doing witnessing babies dying in this way, that I realized that those who have had shared death experience have often had a near-death experience. And I was like, well, I haven't had a near-death experience. And then... Africa popped into my mind and I was like, oh, maybe that was a near-death experience. So then I started, um, you know, researching that and finding out more and talking with people about it and realizing that, yeah, that was a near-death experience. There was a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the criteria there, but it was that I didn't recognize it at the time because it wasn't some beautiful blissful experience it was like just being able to move to a certain um degree across the threshold maybe or a certain distance without going the full the full way through the the tunnel or that or that veil so um yeah well, sorry I, I don't think know where that, I was going for that <laughs> I think it's really interesting that you said that most people who've had shared death experiences have had near death experience. Cause I also have had a shared death experience. I wonder if mm -hmm. somewhere in my past, I had a near death experience 
there's a couple mm -hmm. of opportunities there. I need to do some mm -hmm. regression or something and see if something happened to me before that. I've never heard that before. So you just opened up a whole yeah. new concept for me. So thank <laughs> you for that. That's really quite That's fascinating. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was it was just something that I found on Google. It was like, yeah, if you have shared death experiences, well, there was a higher proportion of of people having shared death experiences that have also had a previous near death experience. So it was saying that that yeah, if you'd had a near death experience, you were more likely to to have a shared death experience than someone who hadn't had a near death experience before. So yeah, it was really interesting because it, it blew my mind as well. Yeah. And I, I also think that it's interesting how you just thought you had a panic attack because I too, my shared death experience, someone told me it was a panic attack. So for 20 years, I thought it was a panic attack. And then mm -hmm. it all unraveled mm -hmm. all at once in like the last year. So mm -hmm. it's just been a crazy ride for me. But it's interesting that it's so similar how we can relate it to a panic attack because it's so outside of our realm of normal everyday life and it does mm -hmm. feel like you're kind of outside yourself and when you mm -hmm. were in this room you said your experience was fearful so you didn't yeah. have this beautiful loving presence experience or anything like that no. And I think because I, I was still very connected to my human body and mm -hmm. I think I was, I was very aware, like this part of me that I'd like the best way I can describe it is my consciousness split. And, you know, and that was something that was very unfamiliar to me. So it was confusing. And I think sometimes, well, I think with me anyway, like if I'm in a state of confusion, then that's often when the fear arises. Mm -hmm. And because there wasn't any, as I said, there was no angels, there was no past relatives, there was no light. Um, I couldn't see anything other than this screen on the wall. I think it just, the unfamiliarity of it and the darkness of it, um, yeah, just shifted my energy into, into fear. And yeah, so I think that made it even harder for me to recognize it for what it was and even more likely to label it as a panic attack because, you know, that's how I felt. Like I felt that part, that me that was still in the water that I could still feel all those, those rocks and everything, you know, that part of me was very fearful because I could not breathe. I didn't know which way was up. I, I was completely disoriented which brought up so much panic for me because I was like, you know, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I can't breathe sort of go into a state of survival, very primal. But then there's this other part of me that it's so weird. I'm, it's, it's like I'm having two experiences at the same time and neither of them are really making sense to me and certainly nothing that I was aware of. And so, and it was disorientating. Like I do remember this um, very strong feeling of being in two places at once. Like I'm I'm there in the water, but I'm also here in, in this dark room and both of them feel equally as real as the other. And my human brain that was obviously still online, I hadn't lost consciousness or anything like that, um, you know, I couldn't understand that. So it's like my brain was trying to figure out what was happening and I had no reference point. You know, I had nothing to kind of guide me to say, hey, like this is what's happening. So it was, yeah, it wasn't a nice experience for me. And it was probably, well, that was 2011. So it was, it was probably 2018, 2019, where, when I had these shared death experiences that I realized. So for the best part of a decade, you know, like, you know, eight, seven, eight years, I thought it was a panic attack. Near death experience did not even enter my realm you know, so it was very then confusing to then try to reframe it as a near-death experience because I'm like panic attack, panic attack. So it was a, yeah, very interesting journey to go through. And you were kind of going through some things and that's the reason why you were in Africa in the first place. You were feeling overwhelmed and burnt out. Do you feel like, do what do you call the source do you call it the universe god what do you what's your terminology for it 
I usually use universe. Sometimes I say source, um, but normally universe is generally my standard. Yeah. So do you think it was the universe's way of coming in and kind of cracking you open and saying, listen, you need to get back on track? A hundred percent. It's like you need to change here. Something needs to something needs to be different. You need to shake things up. It's almost like that sense of like, you know, you've been going down this path here and now it's time to change. It's time to course correct. It's not like I've been on the wrong path, but it was time to get onto a new path. And I think because I was so left brained and still had a lot of that conditioning and indoctrination from the church on board, it took something like that for me to change courses because I wouldn't, I can't imagine I would have just suddenly started being interested in this stuff. Like it had to take something that was going to almost, yeah, change or pivot me, um, yeah, with sort of outside of my control because I, I wasn't in that space where I was even looking for anything spiritual or, you know, other than that big that big question around like why do babies die? You know, that was, I guess, edging towards that more soul, spiritual, bigger picture questions. But um, but that's as far as it had been for me until I had the, yeah, this experience and then the other ones to follow. Tell me about your first shared death experience and what you thought about that, how it affected you. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I thought I was crazy. Um, that's you know, with, with all three of them or by the third one, I was like, okay, there's something to this. Um, but yeah, the first two in particular, so all three of them were very, very different, all very like different situations, different families, different, um, circumstances, different ages of babies, um, and different spiritual phenomenon that were coming through. Um, but the first one I had involved a um, visitation dream the night before. It was a Thursday night. I'll always remember it. It was kind of like I was just on that edge of sleep and I felt the presence of this baby. She showed it was a baby girl born at around 23 weeks, so very, very premature, um, had had a lot of complications. She was only about a week old. And I had had a few days off work and I was meant to go, well, I was due to go back to work on the Friday, went to bed Thursday night. And as I was drifting off to sleep, yeah, I, her name came to me. I saw her in her cot. Um, and I saw, you know, when babies in the nursery, they have like a little cardboard cut out with like their name and their date of birth and their weight and all of these things on it. And I saw that in my mind's eye. And then I felt her presence. Um, I'd had by this point, I'd been having a lot of spiritual experiences with babies in the lead up to the shared death experiences. So by this time I was used to communicating with them. I was used to seeing, hearing, feeling things from them in different ways, which is like a whole other <laughs> journey for me. But the the shared death experience was, yeah, her. it started by her coming to me and telling me, she's like, I need to be out on the balcony. I want to experience the fresh air of the earth before I leave. Because obviously she'd been inside a hospital, you know, no fresh air for, you know, I think she was eight or nine days when she passed away. Um, but she said, I need, I need to be out on the balcony. And I was like, well, what can I do with that information? I can't exactly rock up to work the next day and say, Hey, like this baby came to me last night and wants to go out onto the balcony to die. Um, so I was like, okay, how am I going to navigate this? Because I, I'm very passionate about listening to what these souls have to share because they have so much wisdom to share with us. And I went to work and, you know, as I said, I'd been on a few days off. I went to work we had our team hand over like we do at the beginning of every shift. They said that they were planning to redirect her care, which is medical terms from changing from active intensive care intervention to um, more comfort measures and, you know, with a plan to slowly remove, um, you know, different like medications and tubes and, and all of these things. 
Um, so that was the plan for today. So it sort of validated the experience I'd had with her the night before in that she'd wanted to die on the balcony. Um, and I'd said to her, I can't, I can't give that message. I can't share that message. I'm not in a, a space to be able to, or in a role to be able to, to share that message. So that was hard for me because I, I wanted to give her what she wanted, but anyway, I was not caring for her that day, but I was working, looking after other babies very close to where she was and around, I can't remember the exact time, but it was late morning on the Friday. Um, I saw her, um, she was placed on her mother's chest wrapped in a blanket and they, and I said, where are you going? And they said, we're going out to the balcony. And so with that, this huge wave of emotion came over me and I'm like, thank God she was able to get that message to someone who could action it. Um, and so I felt a lot of relief that she was um, getting what she wanted and that she was able to pass away outside on the balcony and just so happy. I had so much joy in my heart that she was going to be able to feel the sunshine and have that fresh air around her. So that was like the, the first part of it. Oh, but oh what happened gosh. next? Hold on a second. Like yeah. that, that is just absolutely amazing. And um, really a miracle that she was able to get through to multiple people and talk them into taking her out on the balcony she must have visited with her mothers and asked her to be yeah. brought out to the balcony as well and so how validating for you to did you ever question this experience i know you said you thought you were going crazy did you think was that just a dream or am i hallucinating yeah absolutely you know i was still working as a nurse at that time so i've I was and still am my own biggest skeptic with all of this, you know, my, that left brain has not left my side. And so I question, I question everything. So yeah, I did question that dream. I was like, was it, was it a vision? Did she come to me? Was I, was it like a, a premonition? Like all of these things, but, but what happened the next day? And I, I felt so strongly that it was her mother that she was able to get that message to her mother and her mother said, can we go out to the balcony? So I feel strongly that it came, that she was able to get the message to her, um, which I was so grateful for because I I didn't need to try to get that message across in a non-weird way to my colleagues. Um, but, but yeah, you, you certainly do question yourself, but I, but I think it's healthy as well. Like I think it, it's it's healthy to 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 question things and and reflect on things it's it's been a big a big part of of my journey um but but yeah like what happened after that is I had a very similar experience to the near-death experience where my consciousness split in two and I was in my body I was there in the nursery I had other babies to care for so I was trying to be this normal nurse looking after the babies in my care, but what was happening and the, there was like, again, there was a, a similar feeling of being in two places at once. There was another part of me that was out there on the balcony with her. And it was, it was like, um, the best way to describe it is like, you're in a room that you can see like 3d reality, but there's like this filter or this lens that comes over the top that allowed me to see something else that was happening in another part of the hospital, even though it was only, you know, a couple minutes walk away to where the balcony was. Um, but I was able to to see both at the same time. Um, but what was most extraordinary with her is that sort of, yeah, that late morning is that this lens, this filter came over me and I saw all of these angels it's, it's hard to describe. There would have been hundreds of them, if not more. They were very, you know, traditional in the way that they were in white. They had wings. Um, but interestingly, with that shared death experience, is they were also playing music. It was, I don't know, I didn't recognise the music. It wasn't, I don't know, it, it was sort of sounded like trumpets or horns or, or something but there was some sort of music that I could hear, but it was very, very sweet, very angelic, very joyful. Um, 
and and what happened is like I I saw all of these angels come into my view and the only way I can describe it is that they they took her they they picked her up they they took her soul from her body at at that time and um and it was a huge celebration it was incredibly joyful she was happy she was free she was peaceful she was no longer stuck in this like tiny little human body with all of these tubes coming at her she was it was very peaceful and it, it reminds me of a you know when a baby's born into this world there's my experience is that there's some kind of death from the spirit world and in in the other direction like when a soul leaves the earth world there's there's some kind of birth rebirth back into the spirit world so so it was like this celebration that that she was home that she was back that she was safe and it was re really challenging because there's also the incredible devastation and grief that I could feel from these 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 parents but there was also this at simultaneously at the same time and to the same degree intensity is is this incredible joy and so trying to hold both at at the same time and when I went back later to you know because being a nurse I've with all of my experiences I have gone back I've tried to find validation and evidence to back up my experiences and to be able to I'm not really supposed to do this, but I would go back and, and, you know, look at notes, you know, hospital notes to, to see if I could find some sort of um, correlation with, um, with my experiences and what was happening clinically or physically. And with this, with this baby, it was like, um, it was just that the angels came and got her a few minutes before they took the breathing tube out. And so, um, and I, it's been a common theme in all three shared death experiences that the soul of the body leaves before the physical body dies. That has been a common theme through all of them for me um, because the, it, I don't know, it's been my experience that the body needs a soul to be able to, to live. Um, and then when that soul leaves, that then gives the body permission to um to die essentially um so yeah I was able to to um find the evidence that my experiences that yeah her soul left her body just before her breathing tube was removed and then not long after that her breathing stopped and her heart stopped beating so um it was yeah a very powerful experience for me but also very challenging because it, it sort of puts me in the extreme of of um two worlds the you know the most intense grief you can experience around or a, that a parent can experience is the loss of a child but also the the most beautiful experience of a soul leaving the body and returning to spirit and their peace and their joy and that celebration um so yeah, it was it was pretty wild. It was pretty pretty powerful. <laughs> it's, and you're blowing my mind because I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, but so many of the things that you're saying are in direct parallel with so many experiences I've had as well. Um, and it's just mm -hmm. incredible how how real the other side is. And when you tell people about your experiences, they can relate. And it really brings it all together for so many people. So I just want to point out how grateful I am for you sharing your experience because you're helping so many people in ways that you probably don't even know. Um, so it, you're a blessing. But oh, thank you. did this, did this, you saw now like the other side, the joy and the happiness and the bliss on the other side that you didn't get to experience when you're when you had your near-death experience, did it kind of change your viewpoint about the other side at all? Yeah, a hundred percent. I feel like I've come like full circle with all of that now. And and now I'm seeing, and I've had so much more insight into the spirit world and like the journey of that soul to and from the earth and other places that we, that we go as well. And so it's, it's really helped me to 
find a lot more space and softness and understanding around death because that's you know I was exposed to death from a very young age and so it's it's always kind of I think held a lot of fear for me so these journeys for me have been incredibly healing for me and has helped me to really release that fear that I've always had around death even though that near-death experience for me was fearful I've now come to realize that it was that there's so much more to that and so much more to to life and death and the soul's journey than we were ever taught or or made aware of, which has just brought so much peace into my heart. Um, and and also, you know, I've stepped out of the hospital now because I, I wasn't able to, you know, what I wanted so deeply was to be able to share that experience with those parents. But I, I couldn't in, in my role as a nurse, like I would have been sacked for, you know, for, for saying something like that to them. So, um, so at least now I'm able to, to share these experiences with those who need it most, which is their parents. And look, it's been really powerful for me, but I feel like, you know, it would have been even more powerful for them at some point, maybe not right at the time, but at some point to be able to, to, to see that and to be able to, to have some insight into what was going on behind the scenes as their hearts were breaking and this baby was leaving the earth. Yeah. What was going on behind the scenes and behind that veil for, yeah, for this, this beautiful baby and this incredible swarm I don't know of of angels that that came to that came to collect her so yeah so powerful very powerful and so this was the first the first of your three shared death experiences is that right yeah yeah and so let's Um, stay here for just one minute when you had this did you realize that it was a shared death experience um I didn't know that's what it was called but I knew I'd experienced something more powerful than simply um, connections with babies. You know, as I said, I'd, I'd had a lot of, um, you know, I'd had, you know, by this point, by the time I had my sh- first shared death experience, I'd had two to three years of um, working with babies differently and like um, seeing images around them, hearing words from them, feeling things in my body. So I was used to that. I got to a point where, I, that was becoming quite normal for me. Um, but this shared death experience, it was something that went so far beyond that, those experiences that I knew it was something different and I knew it was something powerful. And it was also something that I, I was unfamiliar with that type of experience and the, the intensity of it, because there was so much emotion moving through me as well. Um, so again, that left brain part of me is like, well, why did that happen? Like, what is that? Like, please explain, like I need answers. So, and that was when I started looking and and found out about, you know, shared death experiences and being able to witness another soul, um, or being present at the same time that uh, a soul is, is leaving their body. Um, so, so yeah. And as I said, it was very, very different. All experiences involved angels for me, but they were very, very different, um, experiences and, and circumstances that, that came through around that, which, you know, in many ways was even more, um, confusing for me, but in, in it also helped to, um, it also helped me to understand that I wasn't making it up. Cause it wasn't like, Oh, I've had that experience before. Here's another one with a different baby. It was, it was so different that I knew that my own imagination couldn't even make that up because I, I wasn't even aware of those possibilities and, and those images and those beings and, and those situations. So, um, so I think it's actually helped me that they were all different. And I think it shows that, every we there's no one way there's like you know there's everyone experiences these things differently um in different ways and and that's what i love about it as well is is that 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 variety of experiences that i feel are just as valid as 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 the next one it's just that different experience of yeah 
a, a similar process and in this case death you know it yeah. happens to all of us but but we yeah it's it's we experience it differently I think it's important to point that out I'm glad that you did because the spiritual journey itself is so personal and I think a lot of people and that's where you know we were talking about earlier the the organized religion it kind of puts everything in a box and says this is the way it is and anything outside this is wrong I don't think people leaving yeah. organized religion are, are running from God or the truth they're running from restrictions and so mm -hmm. I love how you mm -hmm. talk about how they were all different because it it does mm -hmm. show us that everyone is going to have a unique experience and because and every near-death experience is different and unique and people question that you know why is this this way why did their experience happen that way but other people's happens this way and it's because there's mm -hmm. as many different experiences as there are human beings and I, your your story is clear evidence of that so i just really enjoy that you brought that out how long was it between the first one and the second one the shared death experience um, so so the shared death experiences i had one in 2018 one in um 2019 and one in 2020 so roughly a year apart between like there may have been yeah it wasn't exactly 12 months apart each but at least a few months like yeah between shared death experiences it wasn't like they happened all in a row or anything like that it was yeah three over yeah three years essentially and so what happened the second time it was another baby in the NICU yeah, so the other two experiences were actually with um uh two different sets of twins. So um the the second one was probably the um the briefest one for me because it was a very fast death. So this was um a set of twins. They were also very premature, born from memory around 25, 26 weeks. Um they were born by an emergency because um one twin had stopped growing. So they delivered both twins and um, the bigger twin was okay, was relatively stable as you can be at that age. Um, the small twin very, very quickly went downhill and only survived a few hours. But what happened with her is that she, um, I, I sensed that I wasn't actually looking after her, but I, you know, in the same department, obviously, I think as nurses, you tend to get pretty good at picking up on when things aren't going well for a particular baby without there necessarily needing to be words or, you know, it, it's kind of like an energy thing. It's like, okay, things aren't going well over there. Do they need a little bit more help? Like what's going on? Um, but what happened with this baby and made it very different is it was colourful. So when I went over to see if this you know, this, the medical team and nursing staff needed an extra pair of hands, you know, see if I could help out. As soon as I saw the mother, um, she was just covered in bright green light. And I'm not one who generally sees auras. Like I don't walk around life seeing people's auras. That That's not part of my lived experience. So when I saw, you know, I'm in full nursing mode, left brain nursing mode, thinking, am I going to have to jump into a resuscitation here? Um, and I walk walk to the space, the area, and I just see all of this green light. It was so, like, it, it's so hard to describe, but, like, this woman was so, um, it's like the green light was smothering her to the point I could hardly even see her human form. It was just so intense. And she, they had just put the baby on her chest when babies are not doing well, when they put the baby on the mother's chest, it's normally because the end is is close. And so um, what I felt and what came through to me at that time is that this angel um, with green light, um, you know, I feel was like Archangel Raphael um, who came to, it was very much, this energy was, was very much for the mother but also came to collect that soul as well. So it wasn't 
this one was much more of a feeling experience, whereas the first one was much more of a visual experience. So this one was, um, yes, this green light coming, feeling like this, this light was trying to comfort this mother in her incredible grief, you know, 12 hours earlier, she had two, what she thought were healthy babies inside of her still many, many weeks before she was even thinking about giving birth. And here she was both babies born a twin on her chest who was not going to survive. Um, and then what happened is they, um, this, yeah, this green light was then started to surround both of them. It was sort of moving from her and then it was sort of enveloping this baby that was now on her chest. And then I felt the, the green energy take, again, it's, it's hard to describe, but take the soul of that baby. And then a few minutes later, they pulled out the breathing tube and almost immediately, um, the heart stopped beating. So that one was, was very, very quick. Like I would say within minutes, um, so it yeah it was very very visual but it was also it was that same joy um but also with this one there was there was a much deeper healing energy like this angels like I'm I'm here to support this mum on her journey because she needs she needs something right now um she was probably not even aware that there was a this huge like being this huge light that was um you know it was probably rippling out I mean I don't know like probably six feet like in either direction it was this huge energy and she was inside that along with the baby and then yeah once what I felt like that soul leaving and it's just like this this essence I don't know how to describe it of the baby that leaves and then it is just like this physical body that's left and then, as I said, they removed her tube um, and then that was it within, yeah, it was very, very quick, probably within a minute or so um, that the heart stopped and, and all of that. But the interesting thing with her is I continued to connect with that twin um, for several days after she died. She was present with, with the surviving twin who went on to survive and, and went home, you know, after many weeks she survived. Um, but that twin was always, um, always close by. And then I went on to have some, some profound experiences with that, the twin who died, um, yeah, asking to, um, come through me to be able to feel her twin. Like when I was holding her twin and giving the surviving twin to her mum for a cuddle, this other twin is this really strange feeling of like this energy moving into my body. It was very peaceful. It wasn't, it wasn't invasive or anything like that, but she's like, I need to feel her. And so I felt this energy come into my body through her. I was holding this twin in my hands halfway between the incubator and the mother in the chair. All of this emotion came up and it was just the words like, just stay, like, let me hold her. And I'm like, okay, what's going on here? Again, I'm in nurse mode trying to give this mum a cuddle and I've got all these other things I need to do. So, um, but I just paused, I just paused and I just pretended to, um, you know, readjust my hands and, you know, and, um, and, you know, make sure no cords were going to get stuck or anything like that. And then I put the baby on mum's chest. I felt the energy leave immediately and then I picked up a blanket to put over mum and baby, a blanket I've used, I don't know how many times while I was working in that hospital. And when I put the blanket over, I stood back and I realized the blanket was covered in angels. I had never even noticed that before, that the pattern on this blanket had little um, gold and purple angels like all over it. So, um, so yeah, so it was very, very different to to the first experience. <laughs> oh my gosh. And heart wrenching and comforting at the same time to have the angel surrounding the mother and giving her support is just, I never heard of anything like that as her baby died. Oh, I can't even imagine. Mm. And then mm. the green light that was around the baby 
what do you think that represented? Um, I feel it was healing energy and, you know, I, you know, green light is, you know, often associated with the heart chakra, you know, like her heart is literally ripping in two at that moment in time. Um, you know, she, I, I just felt that she needed the, like a really pure healing, unconditional, um, loving heart energy to support her in, in that moment. So that's what I feel it was. I, I feel like it was, it was, um, like feeling her, not even feeling, but supporting her, her heart chakra as it bursts open with this like indescribable, um, grief, shock, devastation, um, you know, all of these, these sudden and really extreme human emotions. So I feel like that energy was supporting her. Uh, yeah. Supporting her at that time. And the other side was very well aware that you were witnessing this because then she came through you to feel her twin and what a beautiful gift that yes. is for you. It was, it was really, it was really powerful to, to feel like I could, I could help her that I could help like both twins. I felt not only the, the twin who didn't survive, the twin who had returned to spirit, I felt so much joy and almost like a sense of completion for her and at the same time I felt really strongly the baby I was holding was receiving her twins energy as well and again that that familiarity of um you know spending a few months in the same tiny little womb space like with each other um and that they were able to have like that that final I guess reconnection from different size of the veil from different realms um so yeah it was it was another really powerful experience oh yeah I can't even imagine to be involved in something so strong so so spiritual I mean connecting with both mm -hmm. twins it's just amazing and so then you had one mm -hmm. more shared death experience with a, another set of twins you said right yeah, and this again was was very different. Uh, other than it being a set of twins, they were born again around twenty six, no, maybe a little bit younger. I think they were twenty four or twenty five weeks. Um, and the, these two twins had a very challenging journey. Um, the the twins were from memory they were around five five or six months of age. Um, when the when one of the twins died. Um, I, again, I'd had a lot of experiences with them, like supporting them when they had to go for surgery, helping them to understand what was going on because nobody ever tells the babies what's, what's going on or what, or what is being done to them or what tests they're having and why. So I would, that was a big part of, of my journey as a nurse is like explaining to these babies either out loud or in my mind telepathically, like what, what was going on. And so I'd had a lot of conversations with both of these babies. I know it sounds crazy, but um, in in the lead up to this, but it got to a point with this with this one twin that she wasn't getting better. She had been on a ventilator for um, the majority of her five ish months on the earth. It had caused a lot of damage to her lungs, and despite all of the latest research and treatments and interventions available, like she was just not getting any better. So it became clear that she wasn't going to survive. And then there were plans to redirect her care. And um, because this was such a long-term thing, the parents were given the opportunity, like, when do you want to um, redirect her care? You know, what day? Um, you know, all of these things. And I had seen her on the Monday and it was decided that they were going to redirect care and extubate her, so remove her breathing tube on the Thursday. So on the Monday, I don't know, this is just what I learnt to do, is I went and spoke to her, um, explained to her what was going to happen. I explained that she was going to be um, leaving the earth, and I asked her if she had any questions or any anything that, you know, she wanted to share. I explained like the physical process of, of what happens when we're, you know, redirecting care and, and all of these things. I was, um, yeah, just explaining like what was, what was going to happen. And, um, you know, it was a really, 
I know, again, it sounds crazy, but it was a very beautiful conversation and, you know, she had a lot of peace around it. She felt very, um, she was very okay with it. She, she did not want to continue. Mm -hmm. That was where, that was very clear from her is she did not want to continue, um, this journey on earth. Like her body was exhausted. She had just had nothing left to continue. So, um, what happened is on the Thursday when it came time to um, redirect her care, I had the day off and very interestingly, but I'm sure somehow divinely guided um, around 11 o'clock on the Thursday, I was going to my weekly meditation circle and we went into a deep meditation and suddenly she comes to my mind. So I'd had a couple of days off. I hadn't been at work since Monday. I didn't know the details of the plan or the timing, it just got to a point that, yeah, at 11 o'clock I sat down, we did our little process to go into our um, meditation. And um, I, I, again, mm. I went into two places at once. I was in this meditation circle in a little cabin in a valley and the hospital I worked at was a 45 minute drive away. So there was the other experiences happened in the hospital whereas um this one happened and I was quite a distance away from where the actual baby was mm -hmm. so I sat down I'm I'm seeing her I'm like something's happening I don't know what's happening but they're they're starting to do something something is happening to her like in the hospital so I just like sat with it and just like allowed the scene to unfold in front of my eyes. I didn't know it was going to happen. And then the familiar sight of angels came and I saw it was different this time. It wasn't a whole heap of angels like the first one. It wasn't a color like the second one. It was, I don't know, there was maybe 10 or 12 angels and they were in like a semicircle kind of above this baby. So I could see the baby. I could see the parents who I'd known very, very well by this point. Um, I could see her cot and all the medical stuff around it, all the equipment. And then it's like hovering above that was, yeah, like this semicircle of of angels, white angels with wings. Um, I don't think there was any music that I remember in, in that one. But, um, but then what happened, again, my consciousness split again and suddenly I'm there. I'm there in the room and I'm holding her and it still even now brings up a lot of emotion for me. And so I'm in there in the space, I'm in the room and in this vision or that I can see I'm there holding her. It's not me in my physical 3d body form. It's, it's what I can only describe as my soul or my, my soul's energy, my essence, my true nature, whatever you want to call that stuff that we're made of beyond our human bodies. And I was there and I knew it was me. There was a, a recognition there that I was there and I was holding her up because her body was so dense and so sapped of energy that there was what I was sensing as a gap. It's like the angels couldn't kind of get close enough to reach her because they would need to come very much down into the density to meet that. And she didn't have enough energy for, or her soul didn't have enough energy to kind of lift her own self so that they could meet somewhere in the middle. That's how the experience was for me. And so I had this experience, I'm holding her up and then they came, they all sort of came towards me together, lifted her from my arms. And then I look up and I see her with them like they've got her they're holding her and then suddenly I'm back in my meditation circle again and um it was I you know I'd taken note of the time and I was like okay I'm just going to you know keep a record in my mind and when I go back to work tomorrow because I was due to go back to work on the Friday um I'm gonna check I'm, I'm gonna see what happened between 11 and 12 a.m on um on that Thursday. And so when I returned to work the next day, I had a look and at 11 AM, they had taken her again. They had um, taken her. No, I think they had stayed in the room actually, because they wanted to have the other twin there as well. Um, and there wasn't enough um, like equipment 
out on the balcony for all of the baby's, you know, stuff who was passing as well as the the baby who was surviving. She was still needing some oxygen and, and those sorts of things. Um, so they'd stayed in her room um, and at 11 a.m. they'd move the baby from her cot onto mum's chest um, and then they sat with her. Um, so both parents the twin who was passing as well as the twin, the surviving twin, they were all just there in their own little family huddle, I guess, you know, making the most of the experience or the time they had left. Um, and then, so that was for an hour. So from 11 to 12 and then at 12 PM, the father came um, out to the medical staff and said, we're ready. Can you remove, remove her tube? And then at 12, 15 PM, they took the the tube out so it was from my recollection, it was just before 12 noon that um, that the angels and me apparently helped this soul leave her body. And then it was only a few minutes later that they took the, the breathing tube out. And it was a couple of hours from memory that from when they took her breathing tube out to when her heart stopped beating. Um, so she had a little bit longer on her own um, before her body was able to leave. Um, so yeah, so again, it was a very different experience to the other two. And this one, I felt like I was more, and again, it sounds crazy, but more of, I was more active in the process. Whereas in the other ones, I was a little bit more in that observing role, seeing what was going on. But this time I was, it's like, I was playing a role in that. It's like, I had a, a, a bigger purpose in that, like helping to, to guide her soul or to, um, help shift her frequency a little bit so that she was able to rise above the the density you know because she had been through everything a baby could possibly go through in in that in her five months on earth so her little body was really really um yeah really heavy and depleted um but yeah but it was it was again, a very emotional experience for me. I, I come out of my meditation and my meditation circle and I'm crying and I'm like, you know, and they're like, what's going on? Are you okay? And I'm like trying to explain to, thankfully I was in a place where these people knew the work I did and, and kind of like, I could just speak freely about it. Um, and yeah, explain like what I had witnessed and what I had experienced. Um, so, so yeah, so that was the, the third one, which was, yeah, again, very different to, to the other two, but equally as powerful. I think they were trying to teach me something, you know, I've, I've seen these babies I care for, you know, they've been my biggest teachers, you know, I haven't, everything that I now believe has come through my own experiences with these babies. You know, it's, it's not something I didn't go to a workshop. I didn't, um, I'm not believing this stuff because someone told me about it. You know, I've, you know, it's, it's only been through these lived experiences that I actually believe it. So I feel like, yes, but while they're, I guess there's, you know, I'm helping them in some way and supporting them in some way. They've also been a huge part of my journey and they completely changed how, how I cared for them clinically. They, they changed my beliefs around life and death. They helped me to understand the the journey of the soul and the the decision to come to earth and the decisions to leave. Um, it's given me a much bigger picture of of the whole experience and has helped me to deal with being a human in a much more balanced way. So yeah, while they I may have been able to help them, and I really hope that I was able to, but you know they have gifted me with, with so much as well, because if I hadn't have had these experiences, I'd still be probably running away to Africa whenever I couldn't deal with things. So, <laughs> Yeah. And that's an amazing perspective to have is the gifts that you've received from these experiences. I think all around everyone that was involved, you, the babies, and even the parents received some beautiful and wonderful gifts. So thank you. This has Absolutely. just been amazing to hear about your experiences. Since 2020, you haven't had another one. Do you ever have a feeling, like a feeling that a baby is going to leave? Um, I, I did when I initially left the hospital, 
but now it's it's now that I've left the hospital it's it's changed in the way that I'm tuning in with baby in tuning into babies um like before they've even conceived and then other times like I work with a lot of women who have experienced loss so miscarriage termination stillbirth um baby and and child loss and so it's it's communicating with them after they've left um and I think the shared death experiences like deepened my connection to to that realm that enables me to to tap in now almost on demand um to connect with these souls who who have already left the earth and uh um and have information or insights or wisdom to to share with their with their families that are still here on earth so it's even so even though there hasn't been any more shared death experiences it's like this experiences i have had I feel have changed because of them and I feel much more connected to to that realm um to be able to to bring through these these messages and I guess be that that messenger for for these babies cuz they need they need a voice you know we we need to start seeing babies and children as these autonomous beings that are here having their own journey in this lifetime as we all are you know it's it's my experience that we all made the decision to come to the earth and and to have an experience here and it's the same same with babies you know so it it gives a really interesting perspective then when it comes to conception pregnancy loss pregnancy birth you know babies you know right up to teenagers like I I work with you know sometimes 17 18 year olds as well um so so yeah it's again similar to the near-death experience I think the shared death experience has like pivoted me even like a little bit more um into that realm and I think helped to to um to close that gap even even more um for me to so that I am now able to to connect relatively easy most of the time depending on my own energy yet yeah, to to those realms where where these souls hang out <laughs> so and you've created a website to help others is that the best way for people to reach out to you is to go to your website and check that out yeah so my website is bornenergy.com.au and I'm also on Instagram under born energy as well so, so that's the, yeah, either of those ways are the best way to contact me. I do offer baby soul readings for, um, for women at any stage of the journey, um, and also group programs to help women to, to connect with their own babies, because I believe we're all intuitive. I believe we can all do this and, and connect to these other realms. I think I just had a bit of a baptism of fire to connect to that, but I believe that, that we can all do it. So, you know, it's, it's really important to me that, that women feel confident to be able to connect to their own babies, um, wherever they are. So, so yeah. Thank you so much for doing that because when we, I think when we are, mothers you know we're pregnant with our child we have that connection but we just don't know how to utilize it it seems so strong and then we don't utilize it and it kind of just fades away do you think if we continue this connection we develop it we know how to communicate with our child that it continues on beyond childhood yeah absolutely like in my experience like the soul does not stop communicating with us. So, you know, a big part of this work for women is actually connecting you back to your own soul. And then souls can talk soul to soul much easier than like soul to human. So a lot of it, I think, is is us forgetting or being disconnected from our own soul. And when we can reconnect to that and begin to trust that again, um, then the connection, whether it's with babies or loved ones who have passed or whatever else is animals is much much um easier because we already have that that connection to our own soul um not only established but then like nurtured and honored as we go and then as I said the soul never stops communicating in my experience so 
which is powerful. It's like this whole untapped source of wisdom that we can, um, yeah, tap into and and find answers that we might not be able to find here in, in our 3D world. So, Well, the work you're doing is so important. I can't imagine the result of being able to communicate with our loved ones, with our children um, as they develop and they grow, not just as they you know, on the other side, but here on earth, um, that's Mm -hmm. a pretty amazing skill to have and a gift to the world. So you're a blessing to all who receive this information. And I (laughs) wanted to ask you if, if you had one message that you wanted the audience to take away from this conversation, what would it be? I feel it's starting to broaden our minds or broaden your mind to having a to being open to there being so much more than what we can see here and feel you know I think hum like humanity is going through some really incredible changes right now um both you know light and dark as as we all know but it's a really powerful time too to be able to really open up to not only our own intuition, but this bigger picture that our life here on earth is just a small part of that whole journey. And so, you know, I know what really helps me is is when I can, I mean, I disconnect from that at times because I'm human as well, but when I can go back into that space, it just makes my human journey so much easier. And it's, it's, it's that sense of like not sweating the small stuff when you see that bigger picture and we really are just here for a blip of time and we, none of us know when our, when our journey is going to be complete or when we're going to leave the earth. So I think it's just always a good reminder that, that, yeah, there's so much more going on and we're so supported as well. Like there's so many beings and guides and angels and whatever you want to call them um, here, like supporting and guiding us as well, which I think can really help with if, we do start to feel, you know, like we're drowning or we're, we're feeling alone or isolated. It's, it's important to remember that, that we're not, you know, we are very much supported and the more we can open to that support and those different perspectives, the, the more ease we'll be able to, to have on our journey. Not saying it's going to be easy. We all have challenges, but you know, I, I've certainly found myself personally that I, I have a lot more ease in my life now because being aware of these other dimensions, perspectives, bigger picture, whatever you want to call it. (laughs) Lauren, thank you so much for being my guest. This is a really huge blessing for me and I've enjoyed it very much. You have such an important message to share with the world and a mind blowing story to say the very least. So thank you for everything that you do, my friend. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Tia. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for being here. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you being here and supporting my channel. If you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing if you enjoy near-death experiences and other spiritually transformative stories. It helps the algorithm know that this information is useful and push it out to more people. And that's the goal to get as many people to know that we are eternal spiritual beings and that we never die. Our bodies might die, but our essence will never die. And I want people to live with less fear. Let's all spread the word, like, comment, subscribe, share, hit that little notification bell so you get all the notifications when my videos post. Thank you for all of your support. I'm sending love to you.